Thank you, recording in progress. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh. Anyway, uh, I've been messing around with crystal sets for quite some time and uh, accumulated a lot of stuff on my web page since about 1998. So uh, inside this uh, this presentation, I have a bunch of a bunch of links. You don't have to worry about them right now. Uh, there is a, uh, a a link to the presentation PDF in the in the chat here, so you can pick it up when you care to. Uh, but uh, so anyway, uh, crystal radios have been a, a DIY a homebrew thing for more than a hundred years now. And a lot of us find it alluring because what you have here is a passive receiver. Uh, there's no power supply, no batteries. All the energy that gets to your eardrum came from the transmitter. And that might be a thousand miles away if you have a good set, a good antenna. Um, it's kind of hard to get away from some wire up in the air. Uh, and of course, that's a, a transducer that passing electromagnetic waves make current flow to the ground circuit. Then you have a tuned circuit in the middle and a detector and earphones. And uh, that way you've, you've built a radio. Um, editorial comment here. Over the years, there have been millions of radio, of crystal radios built. Most of them were pretty horrible performers. Uh, however, it's not too bad to build, it's not too difficult to build a good one and we'll endeavor to show you how to do that. Um, little background, <clears throat> Marconi in 1896, well, he didn't have a crystal detector, he had a, a coherer and nor did he have any tune circuits. He was just energizing the, tra the transmit antenna with a plain gap and same thing on the receive side. Uh, one of the things I found interesting about Marconi, and this is a, an interesting drawing somebody did, shovel over here on the side. Marconi took half of Heinrich Hertz's dipole and buried it because he was a telegraph guy and it would be a ground return and thus the antenna ground Marconi antenna is born. Um, sticking with Marconi, I found it interesting. Uh, there's this famous four sevens patent from 1900. And um, the, the important thing about the patent is that they got involved with Oliver Lodge, who was a real scientist, and he showed them how to tune both the transmitter and the receiver. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I found it interesting that here in 1900, the receiver was already showing a detector, they called it a responder, in series with a telephone. So the, the way we build crystal sets now goes way back. Uh, the antenna ground system, like I say, you, it, you, unless you want to listen to your strong local stations here in Jersey City, I can kind of get away with murder. but. An inverted L antenna, maybe 20 feet high, 40 feet long. That's a good story. Um, if you've got it, if you're ham and you have a dipole antenna up somewhere, uh, their frequency response rolls off real sharp below the half wave point. So what you do there is you short the feed line and you work it as a T against ground. And of course, improvised antennas wire wherever you can put it clip onto a rain gutter, the old bed springs, et cetera. Now, um, so here's your symbol for an antenna and a ground. And here's an equivalent circuit of something like that. And so for any antenna that's less than a quarter wave long, it's gonna look capacitive. Uh, backyard inverted L is gonna have a capacitance of, yeah, somewhere around 200 puff. And then the, uh, the received signal 
shows up as a voltage source in series with the radiation resistance of the antenna. And so that's where you're getting your signal. Excuse me, grounds. Well, you might already have a good ground system, a ground rod or whatever, but if not, there's all kinds of ways around it for receiving purposes. You know, here I've clipped onto a water faucet, a uh, piece of 3 16th inch brass tubing, <coughs> brass tubing, excuse me. Three sixteenth inch tubing makes a real nice fit in the ground terminal of an outlet. Alligator clipped to a radiator or just pick up on the, on the screw in the middle of your outlet plate. So like I say, you can, you can come up with a ground without a whole lot of, a whole lot of difficulty. <clears throat> now, the other thing you need is an audio transducer of some sort. <laughs> some sort, otherwise known as a headset. Uh, the traditional radio headset is your 2000 ohm thing, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the next, <coughs> next page. Oh, excuse me. Uh, another good choice for crystal radios is the so-called crystal earpiece. Uh, <clears throat> they work pretty good. And there's other set kinds of headsets that will have higher sensitivity, the so-called sound powered telephones. I'm also finding that a lot of the modern, even dollar store earbuds are, are quite sensitive. The only problem with these is then you need a matching transformer. If you have something in your, in your junk box, boy, you're in shape. If you have to go out and buy it on eBay, it could cost a lot of money. So we'll talk about that further later on here too. So those 2000 ohm phones and, uh, you know, they just come right from the original Bell telephone receivers, you know, magnets down here and two coils and a diaphragm. Of course, you had people like telephone operators who weren't going to hold this up to their ear while they were trying to maneuver patch cords. So, the head telephone is invented and uh, they just folded the mag, uh, magnet structure up into the so-called watch case thing here and gave you two of them, one for each year. Uh, this is shown here is the, the classic Western Electric 509. Um, now, <clears throat> and, and this is, this is a trick I really like. You have, a, you have a pair of headphones. You're going to use it for your crystal set. You want to know if it's any good. Hold on to one of the terminals of the headset. Put the headset on. Hold on to one of the terminals and touch a ground. You should hear a, at least a click and maybe a hum. And if not, you better troubleshoot your headset and, and figure out what's going on or else it's just not going to be sensitive enough for, for crystal set use. Only takes, only takes a second to do this. Okay, so what about the crystal? Um, like I said, Marconi shows up using something like this real early on in the transatlantic uh, tests. And what, what he was using was something called the Italian Navy Coherer. And what these guys were looking for was a self-restoring coherer, something that would detect and not have to be tapped. Uh, also became known as an imperfect contact detector. And this one involved uh, a carbon rod and a piece of iron and a, a blob of mercury in between it. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the Italian Navy sort of appropriated this from a uh, Indian scientist, uh, Jadish Chandra Bose, who was experimenting with things like this. And in fact, Bose used Galena detectors for uh, microwave experiments uh, before 1900. So interesting guy. And uh, this was one of the original detectors used with a telephone. This is something, a project that I had made okay. where there is a number of record player arms 
Can, can we can we mute whoever that is? Yeah, I, I'm working on that. Okay. Thank you, Al. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Uh, sort of next step in this thing was Reginald Fessenden in, develops an electrolytic detector. Now, there were electrolytic rectifiers for charging batteries and stuff, but the trick here was that you had to get the electrode really, really tiny so it would work at RF. But, uh, you know, this allowed him to experiment with, tele with radio telephone and achieve transatlantic radio telegraph. Uh, the real, to my thinking, the real father of the crystal set is Greenleaf Whittier Picard. Uh, he happened to be the, the grand nephew of John Greenleaf Whittier. That's why he got stuck with the name. And uh, he, developed, he patents a silicon detector in, in 1906. And then he goes on to try whatever minerals he can find looking for better detectors. He patents the carborundum detector in 1909. He patents the cat's whisker in 1911. And uh, he's a co-founder of wireless, wireless specialty apparatus company that delivered products like this to the commercial market. And um, the, you'll notice while, while, while there's a cat's whisker, there was no mention of Galena. I think that's because of, of the, uh, the previous art from Bose and, and those folks, there were a lot. Of, there was a lot of concern and a lot of intrigue with uh, with patents for all of this stuff. But uh, uh, Picard, uh, you know, really put a stake in the ground for this. So now you're going to build a radio choosing a detector. You want germanium diodes if you have a germanium transistors hanging around, you can use one junction of a transistor for a detector. You might also experiment with mineral detectors. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that tonight, but that's a whole, sort of a whole subset here, but you can find Galena detect, you know, vintage Galena detectors from, from the twenties and they work pretty well. Good, good, good piece of Galena will work just about as well as a, a germanium diode, but it's, you know, you sneeze and then you're readjusting it. Uh, if you have any doubt as to whether your diode is silicon or germanium, take your Harbor Freight multimeter, put it in the diode position, and it will read the forward voltage drop when you have the diode the right way around. And uh, you're looking for something that's down in the 0.2 0.3 volt kind of region as opposed to the 0.5 or 0.6 you see with silicon. Uh, silicon diodes will work as detectors, but you're giving up a lot of sensitivity. Okay, let's build a radio. So you've got your antenna and your ground and your diode and your headset, hook it up you should be able to hear your strong local stations, maybe all at once, but you can hear it. This is the simplest radio you can build. And uh, I, even if you don't bother with wooden screws, you know, you can do this with clip leads. I suggest you do this, you know, just to get a stake in the ground. Now, you know, you have a headset that works. You know, you have an antenna and ground system that's getting you a reasonable signal and you know, you have a diode. So you can move on from there. Okay, so the next step is to add a tune circuit to your radio. And uh, you see here a lot of the traditional things. I mean, I think the, the Boy Scout handbook in the old days had, had this deal, you wind a coil and you put a slider on it. This is the, the Fillmore commercial set that a lot of you probably have in your, your, um, your collection. And of course, the, this is a mother's oats uh, crystal set. Actually, I'd never seen one of these, but I grew up on mother's oats and they used to claim that Quaker's oats and mother's oats were the same fine oatmeal. So I guess it makes the same radio. However, don't, don't waste your time on this stuff because this just doesn't work all that well. It'll work, yeah, but you can build a much better radio. So 
what, what's missing out of those radios? And the answer is variable capacitors. And the reason is that traditionally they're expensive. And so you're trying to build a $2 radio. You're just going to give the guy a coil and a coil and a detector. Uh, if you insist upon buying a 365 single section cap, you can still get them on Amazon for $25. However, you're all radio collectors. Just go look in your junk box or grab the next cast off All American 5 you encounter and take the capacitor out of it. Uh, so that's, that's what you really want to do. And so sort of the next step here is the old standby. You have a parallel tuned circuit between antenna and ground and you bridge your detector and headset across this. Well, that works, but uh, it can work a whole lot better. So let's take a look at it this way. Here's Here's your parallel tuned circuit in here. <laughs> okay. Now, this thing needs, the broadcast band is really pretty wide percentage wise. You've got a three to one frequency range you need to deal with. And then you've got to deal with antennas of varying lengths. So you, you need to take some steps here. Uh, one of the first steps is a tuned circuit like this. And, and this is a, this number here is a, a swag, a silly wild ass guess, but sort of based on you know, a reasonable cue, like 100 or 200. And so you're gonna have an impedance across this thing of way over 100K ohms. And so here you come with your 2000 ohm headset, which really looks like about 10,000 ohms impedance for AC and your diode, and you connect that across the whole tune circuit where well, you're loading it down, you're DQing it, you're throwing away a lot of signal. So the answer is you want to impedance match this thing. And so for starters, connect your detector about to the middle of your, of your coil. That gets you a pretty good match out to the headset. Now on the input side, like I said, you, you're dealing with a three to one frequency range and you want to deal with various antennas. Uh, my solution is to have taps on that coil. And what happens here is when you're dealing with short antennas, then you're going to run the taps toward the hot end of the coil. Uh, and also at lower frequencies, you can go higher up on the coil. This capacitor out here is going to have you tuning this to minimum capacitance here. If you didn't go, if you didn't go down lower on the coil, you wouldn't be able to tune the upper end of the band. So you need to stay, stay flexible. And one of the answers to doing that is some taps on the input coil. So that's a circuit I, I, I didn't invent this, but it's one I adopted over the years. And my first real application of this in public was uh, I was running a Cub Scout den and I wanted these kids to build a radio. But I knew if we did the standard crystal radio, they'd take it home, they'd have no, an no antenna to speak of and they, they'd be disappointed with the whole thing. So let's, let's build a radio that really works. So. It's basically that circuit I showed you on the previous page. Uh, we did it with a spider web antenna. I cut forms for them. I used this because 10 year olds all, only have two fingers that work. You know, you can't expect them to do anything too, uh, too precise. And so they were able to weave, weave the antenna and take the taps. Uh, we twisted taps out of this thing and then soldered, I soldered them for them and just used a clip lead to select the taps. Uh, we built about eight of these. Uh, they went home, about seven of them went on the air and we, everybody was duly impressed. Uh, I uh, had this, that design published uh, by, the, by one of the books from the uh, Crystal Set Society 
uh, back around 1990, uh, you know, here's the circuit. Like I say, you've got your taps on the input and your uh, detector tap down on the tune circuit. Uh, in this case, we were using the crystal earpiece. And in that case, you want to put about a 100K resistor out here because the crystal earpiece electrically just looks like a capacitor. And so you don't have a proper DC load for, for your diode and you get distortion. So the fix for that is, is about 100K across the headset. In fact, I remember seeing a crystal set years ago that had, that came, that was delivered with a uh, resistor soldered inside the earpiece, right in the back, and that takes care of it. So that was the DEN2 set. Fast forward a little bit, uh, I got involved with the New Jersey Antique Radio Club, uh, and uh, on, a, on two occasions, we ran a crystal set seminar where we got together and built crystal sets. And the design I laid out for that was, was this. I called it the pretty good crystal set because it is. Uh, I must apologize to Gar Garrison Keeler and Ralph's pretty good grocery. But, um, you know, pretty simple piece of wood, some masonite for a front panel and the, the capacitor screwed to that, uh, gave everybody the crystal ear earbud. You could buy those for $2 from, from Mauser back in the old days. Um, so here's, here's people at the clinic. And the way to wind these coils is to stretch the wire out. We tied it off to a cyclone fence. And then you walk up on the thing. It allows you to hold tension on it while you're coming, while you're going. And the way we take the taps is with a strip of cardboard that you come over the, over the cardboard with the turns you want to tap. And then later on, you go in and scrape off the insulation. But uh, if, you want, if you want to do this, that's a nice, neat way to wind a coil and have it be nice and tight. You try to sit at your bench and wind it, uh, you better you better be organized to do that. But you tie them off, you stretch the wire out, and it goes pretty easy. Now, a couple of words about the coils there. Uh, you want to make your coils big. Like, that, they, that, that was, those were four-inch pipe couplings. And uh, because the Q increases as the square of the diameter, so going from a two inch coil to a four inch coil makes a real difference in how well it's gonna work. Uh, one of the other things you wanna avoid, and I, in one of my early presentations, I said, well, make them square, you know, make the windings about the same distance as the diameter. But um, if, if, you really, if you really get down to cases, you really want the windings a little longer than that. Uh, I think mathematically about 2.5 times the diameter is the, the real sweet spot, but you don't have to go real crazy. It's just, you don't want to have a four inch coil with a half inch of winding on it or, or a one inch coil with, you know, six, six inches of winding on it. It's, it's the, you're fighting the cue there. Uh, another thing about coils like this, a lot of times you'll see coils wound with, uh, with magnet wire, the enameled wire. And the problem with that is that the adjacent turns are sitting in the strong magnetic field of the turn next to them. And that induces eddy current losses and, and hurts the cue of the coil. Uh, one of the solutions there might be to put your coil form in a lathe and cut a notch, and cut a, a thread in it all the way down to space the wires out. But the easier way is just to use insulated wire. That'll get you a, a, a turn spacing of about a wire diameter and uh, will get you a pretty good coil. Uh, Wire like between number 26, number 20, hookup wire, that kind of stuff 
works real well. If you happen to have any silver Teflon hookup wire, uh, but the, the, the Teflon wire has all been silver plated for uh, chemical compatibility reasons, but that gives you uh, a nice low loss wire. So that would be the thing to use if you can. Uh, PVC pipe is okay. Uh, you can argue that it's lossy. Uh, I found ABS pipe couplings at the at, at Home Depot, which is what I used for the uh, the pretty good crystal set. Uh, this particular coil is just some some piece of stuff that was laying around, but I put it in here for illustration. Okay, and so one of one of our own, Joe Devonshire just built one of these radios the other day. And uh, here it is, he sent me the picture. You know, he grabbed a, a dual section cap and wound a coil and has his taps. Uh, uh, Joe is up in mid Maine somewhere. I don't know, is that is that halfway down east? Is that what you call that? But uh, he reports hearing a couple of the New York stations which are 300 miles away and uh, also uh, uh, even uh, WPHT, which is all the way down to Philadelphia, that's probably closer to uh, going on 400 miles. So that's the kind of performance you can expect out of a radio like this. And I was real glad to see him have that, that success because that's, that's, that's what you can do with a good circuit decent headphones and, an, and, and a decent antenna. Uh, over the years, I did things like I took the same circuit and built some fancier radios with it. This is one I gave away at the NJARC Christmas party some years ago. I'm not sure who ended up with it, but you know, I added actual switch taps here and a build a Galena detector that was kind of inspired by the things on the on the Marconi marine receivers in the old days. So anyhow, use your imagination. Uh, modern computers and programs and graphics allow you to dress these things up with, you know, nice signage and, and, and lettering and whatnot without a lot of fuss. So, you know, leave, you, use your imagination. Uh, another way to build radios like this is to use ferrite cores. And they get you pretty good Q, like two, 300 without a lot of fuss. Uh, you get a lot of inductance in a small space. This, this, coil, this core here is uh, eight tenths of an inch across. And the magnetic field is contained within the core. And that means you don't have to worry about it getting, getting it close to other things or metal in the radio or whatever. So you can, with, with air core coils, if you gotta be a little circumspect about where, how you mount them, uh, these you can you know, pretty much run amok. Uh, also, they require a whole lot less wire. Six or seven feet of wire is, is about all you need. Uh, and you use a, a hook of some sort to twist the taps in them. Uh, if you really get fancy, you can make a bobbin to hold your wire uh, for winding. That's, yeah, that's gilding the lily a little bit. And you then can solder your taps directly to your tap switch. Makes a nice convenient assembly. And this means you can build small radios that actually work. Uh, Here's one I, I did back about 2006. Uh, this was after I moved in out of the country to Jersey City and the crystal set environment is different here. And uh, you, can, you can get away with short antennas. And so I added taps all the way up to the top of the coil here. But uh, uh, this particular set I had God, I'd, I'd come into a number of these nice little wooden boxes. Uh, so I built radios with home, homebrew detector here, Galena detector, uh, dressed up the lid with some artwork. And uh, uh, 
you might enjoy reading my crystal set mobile article uh, where I used this crystal set in a moving car. Of course, it was in the Meadowlands, you know, past the high power stations, but uh, crystal set mobile is possible. Uh, build a, again, I built some of these for gifts. Uh, here's one, one at New Jersey Christmas party, Sal Brashindi and his family won one of those. And this one went to my, my uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, she was underwhelmed until they had a hurricane and lost power and then they hooked it up and used it. So <laughs> anyway, uh, more recently, here's the set I have in my living room right now. Like I say, I'm in Jersey City. I got strong locals. So I've got a piece of wire up behind, up behind a curtain and about 20 feet across the ceiling. And that'll get me six or seven or eight stations that are listenable. And pretty much it's the same circuit, except I've gone with the cheap dollar store earbuds, which I discovered were a whole lot more sensitive. But of course, like I say, you need a matching transformer, but that can be a, a good solution. Uh, I also have a, an article on the construction of those detector stands, which are really quite easy to do. It's just based on a, a fan of stock clip and a little bit of hardware. Now, when you use a transformer to drive a headset, there's uh, something that most people don't recognize right away. And this was pointed out to all of us. Uh, I used to participate in a couple of email reflectors, one of which was called the ferrite core, and it was people building crystal sets. And that's where I actually met Ben Tung. This is Ben Tung of Blonder Tongue Associates, and he was the, the engineering brains there. And he got interested in crystal sets and just, you know, after he retired and really worked it over. And so Ben points out that if your detector is running into a transformer primary like 68K in this, in this case, and we're stepping down to about 50 ohms to go to, go to set of earbuds. That's okay AC wise, but the DC resistance of this winding is a whole lot less than 68K ohms. And that presents an embarrassing DC load to the detector and you get distortion on, on, high, uh, on high signal levels. And the fix for that is that you put a resistor in series with the transformer primary, and then you bypass the resistor, like with a 0.1 cap. And so the resistor isn't there for audio, but it's there for DC and everybody's happy. Uh, by the way, this has been uh, observing testing of crystal sets at the 2006 crystal set seminar. Uh, that Ben has departed, but his website has been preserved and you can get to it here. Uh, ben just really did a thorough job of a whole bunch of things that I wouldn't have had the patience for. But uh, uh, if you get into this, you'll want to want to read through some of Ben Tung's stuff. Uh, another even smaller set I built recently called it the pocket mouse. Uh, this was mostly based on the variable cap and the knob from a $5 Chinese super hat radio kit. And again, using a, uh, uh, a ferrite core. And the advantage of the ferrite core is you can run a whole bunch more inductance here without picking up a lot of capacitance. So you can tune it with say 150 puff rather than, rather than 365. So this, this is a four inch by two inch box, left me build a nice little radio in there. Again, miniature transformer driving the, the cheap earbuds. Uh, and that works pretty nice. Uh, okay, we talked about a pretty good crystal set. Let's talk about really good crystal sets. 
you want high performance, the, the way you do this is instead of a single tune circuit, you want to have a double tune circuit. That'll improve your selectivity, improve your sensitivity, and uh, sort of what you, the, the way you figured this out or way I figured it out was to look at the classic communication receivers. Here's a Marconi 101, which double tuned crystal set. Uh, and there were other things like that, like the IP501 has a tube in it, but the, the, these naval receivers uh, were all double tuned. The other place to make improvements in the crystal set is a more sensitive headset than your 2000 ohm headset. And uh, there's, we'll talk about that a little bit, so-called sound powered phones and the modern alternatives. So, circuit tuner. And here's, here, here's that drawing from Marconi's 4.7 patent. And sure enough, he has a coil that tunes the antenna to ground, and it's coupled to a parallel tune circuit and a detector and a telephone. Uh, here's a somewhat better drawing from Every Man's Guide to Radio 1926. And uh, Sure enough, you've got a series tuned circuit out here. They, that in back in Marconi's days, it's known as the open circuit because it just looks open. Of course, it's completed by the equivalent circuit of the antenna. And when you do this, now the antenna is completely in series with the primary coil, which means you get maximum transfer of energy out of the antenna into this coil. It's called the conjugate match when you have that whole thing tuned as one circuit. Then you magnetically couple that to another circuit like we've seen in the, in the other crystal sets. And you, vary, you can play games varying that coupling and we'll, we'll take a look at that. And first of all, and I, I have to get a better drawing here because this was something for 455 kilohertz IF transformers. But the, the message here is you have a single tune circuit and it'll have some response curve, maybe like that. But if you add additional tune circuits to it, they're response alge algebraically. And the peak still stays about the same, but the skirt selectivity improves drastically. So that's why you want to have a couple of tuned circuits. Uh, two tuned circuits is about the point of diminishing returns. You could try for more, but then you, you, have, you have troubles managing it. So also I mentioned the variable coupling between the tuned circuits. If you couple those two tuned circuits tightly, you'll get a double hump curve. And if you try to move one of these humps over to coincide with the other hump, the other hump will run away from it. So you'll always have a big wide response with two humps. But if you reduce the coupling to the so-called critical point, you'll still have maximum energy transfer, but you get one single response that is sharper than, the, than, than either the single circuits. And then if you go further and reduce the coupling even more, you can get improved selectivity at the cost of sensitivity. So you kind of choose where you are on strong signals. You can take advantage of this. And so that's what's called loose coupling. You may have run into the Navy loose couplers with the telescoping coils and whatnot. That's what was going on there, but for, for long wave use. So anyway, the easy way to build a double tuned radio, a, pr a really good crystal set is first build a pretty good crystal set and then build the second one and put the coil over on the right hand side of it and uh, don't worry about detectors and headsets, just wire it up in series like so. And 
set it on the table, and you can vary the coupling by sliding the two things around, and this will work quite well, a whole lot better than just the single tune set. Okay. Um, you have a question? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's uh, actually we were we're coupling up with one in New England, so this is where you know with Zoom you can do anything you want. Cool. Um, okay, so I, I do. I do have a quick question. Yeah, when, when you build the uh, the two sets like that, we're going to use our lamp as a test. Uh, how far apart uh, is the distance? Uh, you'll, that you're you'll, you'll, you'll find yourself like eight inches or a foot, or maybe even a little more. Oh, okay. It's it's really it, it's yeah. First time you do it, it's really astounding how you know how far yeah. apart two four inch coils will couple, and uh, so that's so why you see you kind of slide it around on the table. Okay, thank you. Sure. I, I, I and, and the two coils now. must be oriented the same way, I assume. Yeah, yeah, they're on the same axis. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, okay, uh, let's talk about about transducers a little more. Uh, back about 1910, a guy named Nathaniel Baldwin designed the um, <clears throat> an improved headset, so-called balanced armature design. It's still got a magnet uh, structure and some coils, but it's got a flat armature in here with a pivot at the middle of it. And then that's connected by a push rod to the diaphragm. This one says aluminum. A lot of them actually have mica diaphragms. And so these things are uh, more sensitive than your standard magnetic headset. Uh, and I actually would like to look at that one a little more. There we go. Uh, so, and, and you'll find these around. There were, there were a lot of them made. A lot of radio guys used them and they're still hanging around. So, you see a set of bald ones. You can usually spot them by the thick, the thickness of the, the earpieces. Uh, they're they're worthwhile. Um, here's some data that I accumulated uh, some years ago. I uh, did some headset testing. Uh, I arranged it so I could uh, so I could feed them with. The same with, with audio from an attenuator, so I knew how much energy was going into them, and then vary, ha, had a, a way that I could match to the output impedance so there wasn't, uh, so, so you were getting apples to apples comparisons. Uh, actually, Ben Tung had a much better, much more elegant way of doing that, but we're not gonna go into it right now. But anyhow, the message was like, there's these, well, these medium impedance, 600 ohmish uh, military headsets, there are a lot of them around from World War II. And first of all, they're low impedance, so they're not a good match to a headset. But then they're not all that sensitive. Uh, I, I could listen to audio and understand it down to about minus 63 uh, dBm. Now, uh, keep in mind, that zero dBm is a milliwatt, minus 30 is a microwatt, and minus 60 is a nanowatt. So we're talking about really small amounts of power here. And it's because the human ear is as sensitive as it is that we can, we can do these things. So your traditional 2000 ohm headsets, and I had two from Trim, which make, make really nice headsets. I really like them. But they got you sensitivity about minus 70. And that's good. And that's what most, you know, most crystal set situations have. The earplugs from Mauser, of course, they, they're, they're capacitive. So they have an infinite resistance and a pretty high impedance. And they'll get you the same sort of sensitivity, sort of minus 70. Um, had a pair of brush crystal headphones. Now, the ears have not been, they've got Rochelle salt elements, 
and uh, the years have not been kind to them. Uh, humidity beats them up. But I had a pair that was actually working in pretty good shape. And these were maybe 4 dB more sensitive than, than the standard headsets. The Baldwin, Baldwin Type C, I got down to minus 76. So between 70 and 76, 6 dB is a, a nice improvement. And that's, uh, that's worthwhile if you can find a set of Baldwins. Now, the, the phone company and others and the Navy for years has used sound powered telephones on board ships. And the reason you do this is the, the transmitter generates the signal. It's, it's basically a headphone backwards. And as long as you have two wires between two of these headsets, you can talk. You know, the whole rest of the ship can be shot away and you can still communicate within the ship. Uh, these are the ones on the left here are the, the so-called big cans from World War II. And later on, they may even still be using these more modern ones. Uh, and there are some sound powered handsets. You, you can take the elements out of those and it's helpful. So anyhow, I had two of these that I had set up and tested. And they had sensitivities of minus 84 and minus 88 dBm. That's compared to minus 70. So a headset like this is as good as putting an amplifier on your radio, the audio amplifier. And so that's part of the deal here is, you know, if, if you really get serious about this, you may want, you may want sound, to look for a sound powered headset. Uh, got a link here to some information about that on the website. Now, the other thing about this is like I said, I, I did some testing on the cheap earbuds. And what's happened these days is all of these things out of China, rare earth magnets, very powerful magnets. And that results in the earpieces being really, really sensitive. And I measured sensitivities down here in the same range as the sound powered telephones. So, as long as you can get an appropriate matching transformer, you can get away with a, a dollar store headset and be in pretty good shape. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, this was back around the turn of the century when I, the, the crystal set guys I was hanging around with on the web ran some uh, crystal set DX contests. And this was the radio I built up for that purpose. Uh, these were six inch PVC pipe coils wound with number 16 uh, silver Teflon wire. They just sit on these towel bars on these pieces of PVC and the boxes down here have the tune circuits and the transformers and whatnot. Uh, this was a double tune set. And then there was an additional circuit here that you could use as a wave trap uh, you'd get tuned to a station and you'd use this to, to suck out an inter interfering station. So, well, how well did this thing work? And uh, I, I did a log for this. Uh, New Jersey Antique Radio Club runs a, uh, a broadcast band DX contest every January. We're still doing that. But here's my log from, uh, from 2001. Now, I was out in the country, uh, and the antenna I had was a 65-foot-long a uh, three-wire flat top with three wires with eight-foot eight foot spreaders on the ends. And so it was a pretty, a pretty effective antenna. But with, with this radio and that antenna, heard I get just about all the Chicago stations and, of course, Atlanta and Nashville but also heard back in those days, there was a high power station down on Turks and Caicos Island, uh, about 1300 miles down. Uh, heard Radio Raylo, the time signals out of Cuba, that's over 1200 miles away. And 
uh, New Orleans uh, over 1,100 miles away. So if you really get serious about this and you have an antenna, and that was sound-powered phones, so the, the type we, we, we saw a couple slides back, that's the kind, the kind of performance you can end up with. Also, I built a, a double-tuned a double set using, uh, using the ferrite cores in a nice wooden box. Uh, double-tuned here, you don't get any coupling between the, the toroids, so, you went, so I ended up with the third coil that's shared between the input circuit and the secondary circuit. And by varying that inductor, you're varying the coupling to the uh, to the secondary. Uh, I put in a switch to switch between a a Galena detector and a diode inside, and of course, there's a transformer and whatnot. Uh, inside, I had rounded up some really nice. This one's a Hammerland variable capacitor with ceramic insulators. Uh, when you really get down to cases, the a lot of the capacitors with the canolic insulators and whatnot may be lossy enough that they cause a problem. So whenever you can happen into ceramic insulated caps, grab them. Uh, I also use ceramic switches, and uh, this was a, a UTC A11 transformer that did the trick there. And <clears throat> this is pretty much the same set as Neville was showing when we when we started up here and it uh, gives a good pretty good account of itself uh, you know you want to want to just you know leave your imagination run wild and do and do creative things i built a double tuned set in a little seven inch long tackle box uh which you could close up and carry around uh, Again, it was uh, ferrite cores. Actually, I put a switch in so the secondary could be used as a single tune set when you when you were just fooling around, and then you could bring a a primary in here as well. Uh, and uh, in the back, you know, I took this tackle box and hacked some of the partitions out of it and screwed all this stuff in there and made a nice little radio uh, and that here's here's my crystal set travel kit for years uh i used to be a road man for the semiconductor guys i'd often carry a crystal set with me and you know string wire up or hang wire out hotel windows and whatnot and see what you could hear locally and so here's that set here and uh half a half a sound powered headset, some antenna wire, and, you know, clips and pins and not for sticking wire up. Uh, you know, just, just, another, just another part of the crystal set sickness. You could get involved with it if you want to. Um, here's a recent set that I built. Like I said, it was kind of a change of life when I moved to Jersey City and you can't, you really can't hear any DX from here because you've got a 50 kilowatt station every 40 or 50 kilohertz across the band and you just can't summon up enough selectivity to hear anything at a distance. <laughs> so I built this set that, that drives a, drives a horn, horn speaker pretty nicely on <clears throat> seven or eight stations and the inspiration here came from a Telefunken World War I uh, field set. Uh, now, this thing was designed to tune from 500 kilohertz to 2 megahertz. So it was kind of broadcast bandish, even before there was a broadcast band. Uh, most of the marine radios you see all want to tune down, down to long waves. So this was sort of you know, the kind of thing you wanted to do. I didn't have the patience to accurately reproduce the thing, but uh, it's double tuned. 
uh, this the second and then the, the secondary is two bands and there's a non-tuned position so you can you know get your antenna tuned and whatnot double tuned sets sometimes it's difficult to find a station if you're working trying to work the two tune circuits and the other thing they these guys did was in a double tune set when it's lightly coupled you can calibrate the dial on the secondary and then just basically tune to the frequency you want so i implemented some of those design features into this thing uh you know just just wood and whatnot the the primary swivels to vary the coupling uh secondary like i say was tuned in two bands and calibrated dial uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh ben tongue pointed out to us with that resist the benny resistor on the audio transformer was you could also put a sensitive uh, ammeter in there. This is a 20 microamp meter movement. And so you get an S, here in the strong signals of the city, you get an S meter on your crystal set. Uh, also, the, the terminals from the Benny resistor come out down here. So you put a volt meter on if you want to want to measure that. Uh, and I hid my diode inside a Marconi quartz crystal package because it kind of looked like the the one on the original uh, Telefunken set. So Jersey City special. Uh, like I said, leave your imagination run wild and use use the vintage parts you have to to build something. Uh, now somebody else's crystal set. A guy named Mike Tuggle and he's built maybe some of the the best crystal sets anybody's documented anyway and uh, mike used uh basket weave litz wire coils and here it's a double tune set you have your antenna coming in and your secondary and your transformer box for your sound powered headset and then he had additional coils for wave traps now <clears throat> mike used these to great effect in those early DX contests and did real well. But then, then he moved to Hawaii and he killed the DX contests because with this radio, he could hear the Caribbean and much of the United States from Hawaii. So you wanna look at Mike's sets. There's a link down here to, to, to Mike Tuggle. Uh, like I say, I stand in awe of his radio. It's better than my radio. <laughs> so uh, in, in, in conclusion, my message is build a crystal set. It's good for your karma. You'll feel good listening to a radio that you built. It's not that big a deal. It doesn't require a lot of expensive or exotic parts. And you might already have all the parts you need. So, uh, you know, have at it. Uh, do your thing. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs> oh, wow, this was great. So it's a really good presentation. Well, I'll, see, I'll entertain questions if. Uh, How do you make connections to those coils? Uh, uh, basically, you scrape the insulation. You know, you've got you've got the, the turns coming up over the piece of the piece of cardboard and you scrape the insulation away and then you sneak another piece of wire underneath it. Uh, the, the, uh, the PGF, the pretty good crystal sets, we, we put a little, little loop, loop of wire in there to give you a place to grab with the, uh, uh, with the alligator clips, but it's not too horrible to do. You get in there with an X-Acto knife and a soldering iron and you can solder, solder onto the, the turns that where they go over the cardboard. Well, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a tip on the uh, using on on those little transformers. Yeah, if you go on eBay, and this is the one I built, but the little transformers right here, and it's uh, I think about fourteen, fifteen dollars, I think. There's a guy in California that sells 
of parts for crystal set builders. Ah, uh, okay. I had, and this, I had and this has got a 200K to 32 ohm uh, impedance match in 14 steps. Okay. Okay. That, so that'll, got, that'll, got, that'll do it. Uh, I got two, two knobs here, and I can, this is the uh, input side. Yeah. And this is the uh, output. And by varying the input and the output, I can match just about any headset. Uh, though the sound powered ones are the best by far. And some sound powered are better than others. We got two of them, and one's probably four or five dBs better than the other one. Yeah, you got to fish around. Uh, uh, by the way, Bill, I wanted to say hi. I remembered you from AWA years ago and hadn't seen you in a coon's age, but glad to know you're still building crystal sets. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy them. I understand them. <laughs> well, they're simple enough to understand, you know. It, it, <laughs> Some of this modern stuff is a little beyond me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and even if I understood it, I couldn't get my fingers into it. Noel, thank you very much for that great talk. Uh, for me, uh, one of the fun parts of building crystal sets was uh, the detector and trying different metals in there and uh, embedding the metal in some uh, solder. And um, tomorrow or at the show, I'm going to bring a bowl of crystal that people can uh, perhaps grab uh, to build crystal sets, but uh, could you address um, the different materials or uh, are you just fed up with uh, trying to get any signal out of those things? I just enjoy hunting yeah, around with the cat's yeah. whisk. Uh, the galena is, is the most sensitive of the mineral detectors. And there's a couple of kinds of galena. You go to a rock shop, you find these things, the big shiny flat surfaces. Well, that'll work, but not all that well, and it's a little hard to find sensitive spots on them. There's material that they call steel galena. It's very fine, very fine crystalline structure, kind of looks like a broken piece of steel or, or, uh, or cast iron. And uh, that work, that, that stuff works real well. And when you set your cat's whisker down on it, it can find its find its way into a crevice and make a pretty, a pretty good contact. Uh, some of the other possibilities are, there's other minerals like fool's gold, iron pyrite, uh, uh, alco pyrite, which is a, a, a copper ore. Basically, you're talking about metal sulfides, uh, but, but galena is the most sensitive one. Uh, the, uh, an interesting detector is one of uh, uh, is one of uh, Picard's thing called the Paracon detector, which involves a mineral that's almost only found in New Jersey called zincite, which is an orange colored zinc oxide. And if you put that into contact with uh, Bornite or chalcopyrite, one of the copper uh, element, copper detector metals. It makes a detector that you just kiss it together and it works and it stays working. Not as sensitive as Galena, but uh, uh, useful nonetheless. In fact, some of the old some of the old sets like the uh, the the Areola Junior, I guess. Westinghouse built those for RCA, had a had a Paracon detector in it. And uh, that's one of the things. Unfortunately, they don't last. They don't seem to disappear. Yeah, yeah, you find them with missing parts. I I I built, I rebuilt the one, <laughs> the one I was messing around with. Uh, there's a um, <clears throat> there's a thing on my website about embedding crystals in solder. It'll give you kind of a picture of how to do that. Uh, 
there are people who say, well, you got to use wood's metal because it has a low melting point and you're going to destroy the mineral. But I found you can stick things in solder and have them work pretty well. Uh, I don't know if people were here when I made the initial uh, announcement, but in, in the Zoom chat, there's a link to that presentation as a PDF file. And so you can read through it and follow the links out of it to some of these other, other topics. There's nothing in the chat box that I can see. Uh, well, I'll Larry, do it again. I, I, oh. Larry, I also uh, saved it. And so I'll uh, email it to everybody when I uh, upload the uh, uh, recording. Okay, okay, yeah, go ahead Go ahead and do it that way. Yeah, yeah that works. Yeah, and uh, in fact, since Joe was on there, if any of the NJRC uh, doesn't have it, they'll, uh, Joe will import it onward through the communicator. So I think everybody also wants to get this on. Al, I have a question. Al, I have a question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. What are the uh, design attributes of the uh, of the sound powered phones that makes them so sensitive? Are they like, are they, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, they're balanced armature like the Baldwins, except, you know, I, I think the phone company leaned on it real hard until they became exceedingly effective. In fact, those, those sound powered telephones, the, uh, the sound pressure level at your eardrum is higher than the sound pressure level was at the microphone. Uh, it's sort of, you know, acoustic leverage. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Can I, can I tie in some vintage aspects uh, to this presentation? By the way, Al, amazing presentation. Wow. I've been building crystal sets since I was a kid. So uh, uh, here goes. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, first thing I wanted to show you, Al, is uh, my version of the ideal crystal radio, vintage crystal radio. Everybody hear me okay, right? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, good. So uh, this is a picture of a about a 1908, 1912, uh, and it's a dual coil, as you mentioned. So everything that you spoke of, the taps, uh, all of that, right down to the silk uh, insulated wire, falls into everything that you were saying. Uh, and it's amazing that, uh, again, you say 100 years old. Uh, this is over 100 years old, and this is my DX crystal radio. So uh, this is the one I have fun with. It's on about 200 plus feet of wire with a uh, ham radio ground. And uh, the other thing I wanted to show was just a few examples of coils. If my uh, computer ever catches up, let's see. Ah, there we go. So uh, these are the coils that Al was showing. Uh, and, and I bought a, a bunch of these, uh, as you can see on the top. And I began to do some research using my actual radio. And I was using a pair of deck talkers, of course. Um, but I looked into everything from uh, uh, audio output transformers, you know, speaker transformers. Let me get back in there, right? Let's see, find the speak, uh, there it is. So uh, to these guys, which uh, any of us have worked on a All-American Five are, are quite familiar with. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble coordinating. And, and various can transformers as shown down here. Uh, down here, where am I? There we go. Uh, so the can transformers, uh, everything worked, everything worked, but this, was my, I call it my super match. And this, uh, I used to work in uh, with lasers, helium neon lasers. And I found a couple of these 10,000 volt transformers in my uh, junk box. And so what I did is I actually built a, a matching transformer using the two 10,000 uh, 10, ohm secondaries in parallel. And this was the coup de grace. This is the one that that really gave me oh, a good seven, eight percent better signal. And uh, the final looks here is, of course, we would be remiss if we did not have the deck talkers that I can't show you. 
Ah, there we go. So, uh, yeah, yeah, these things are awesome. Uh, again, I've probably got about 50 pair of headsets, but I did not know about the earbuds. So I think tonight you'll find me on the long wire uh, uh, with some earbuds, uh, trying that out with my various transformers. Al, thank you so much. What an awesome presentation. Well, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> You know, Al, um, one of the things I didn't mention to you uh, uh, when I sent you the uh, information about the crystal set that I built was that I, uh, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I do have a pair of bald ones. So that did it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was glad to see you were as successful as you were, uh, you know, kind of validated by design, you know, from a disinterested observer there but you know you so you're you know single to good single tune set you hear three three four hundred miles out without a lot of without without a lot of trouble well, 1010 was banging in here last night before i came on tonight same thing um bloomberg just up the dial uh what is it 12 um oh 1260 i think it is um they're there um if I really work at it, I can still get Buffalo. That's that's probably well, the furthest station on your uh, on your list there, Joe. Is WKBW in Buffalo? Yeah. I found that the Westinghouse 509s work pretty near as good as the Baldwin's. They're they're one of the better magnetic headphones. Yeah, they're 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 within the same range. You know, like I said, the measurements I made got a couple of dB better out of the Baldwins. Uh, part of the problem with the Baldwins is they're kind of peaky around a kilohertz. And, and so for, for CW, it's a good deal, but uh, you're gonna, you might lose some intelligibility on speech with them. Al, have you made any shortwave crystal sets? And if so, what kind of luck have you had? Well, I have. Uh, and there's there's some of that on the on on the website. Uh, built a double tune set uh, using air ducts. You know the stuff you use for the for the outputs so, and, so and transmitter. I. And uh, uh, could could easily hear Europe stations like Radio Exterior de España and things like that. Now this was all ten. 12 years ago when international broadcasting still existed. Uh, about a year ago, I threw one of these sets together again just to see what would happen. And well, it, you can get the X from Jersey City on, on short wave, except all you could hear was Brother Stare and Havana, Cuba. But yeah, you could build, you could build effective uh, wave crystal sets. Uh, there's a really interesting uh, video on YouTube uh, by uh, our friend Mike Murphy, W2UD. His, mm. uh, his YouTube ID is uh, microwave spelled with a K. And he does, there's a shortwave crystal set demonstration that he does up there that is really, really impressive. He's, he's got his uh, signal generator. He's using as a beat frequency oscillator and he's tuning in 20 meter CW and 20 meter single sideband. <laughs> yeah, well, when, when, you, when you operate a crystal detector that way, you're you're you know you're pumping the crystal and you're eliminating a lot of the losses, so uh, uh, it could it could work pretty well. <laughs> Any other questions for Al? Yeah, one more thing, Al. Um, as far as antennas, uh, how well do loop antennas work? Um, I have a tuned loop uh, that I can use. Um, I, I think up where you are, you're going to find out that's not going to that's not going to do it for you. Um, okay. But you can give it a shot. Uh, the uh, you know 
here here in the here in the city mouse territory, you know, I could some some of these sets you can hear a station without hooking up an antenna because you have enough coupling into the into the inductor. But uh, uh, you can do things with loops if you have strong signals, and especially like the double tune sets, uh, you can just put the loop on the on the input and resonate the loop and. Uh, that can be done, but uh, it's not. You're not going to. You, you're not going to have the pickup aperture that you'd have with a wire antenna mm -hmm. outside. For for you ham radio guys out there, uh, I use a get around the camera. I use a Buckmaster. It's a uh, 160 through six meter uh, long wire offset dipole. And uh, I have had great success with that, but only in the lower bands. I, I find that trying to capture short wave using several types of receivers, uh, it, it just it, it just falls off the, the radar uh, signal wise once you get up into the higher bands. Have you done that? Has anybody used a short, a short wave antenna commercial? You know, I guess not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm curious on using a uh, shortwave antenna. Uh, a lot of the ham antennas now have balance uh, at the end of the feed line. And I would think that would negate uh, having all of the wire up in the air or does uh, it conduct through the balance? Well, if you're talking about trying to use, say, a hundred foot doublet for a crystal set, I think if you short the feed line, that, that you'll still have couple, you'll have coupling past the balance because it's in phase. Okay, All right. I've got a 280 foot open uh, fed by open wire line. I'm looking forward to playing with that. Oh well, yeah, you got a lot of antenna then. And, uh, I'm, I'm a I'm a believer in doublets with open wire feeder. Yeah, and uh, that that's just the easy way right, to do right. these things. Yeah, the the Buckmaster is actually tuned uh, uh, is actually 287 feet, I think. Uh, but yes, it does have the balance, and I always thought of the uh, external part of the antenna going to ground and the center uh, center conductor as the feed-in for your crystal radio uh, with, a, with matching transformers, of course. So I kind of thought of it that way. And uh, that way the ballon has a uh, path to earth ground and also through the radio uh, in the ballon itself. So just my thought. Yeah, well, with, with, with a really long antenna like that, that may work out for you for broadcast band. But like say, an 80 meter dipole. If you feed that, you know, by the coax or twin lead or whatever, you know, differentially one side and the other side, when you get, you don't have to get too much below 80 meters before the two halves of the antenna are so close together that they both pick up the same medium wave signal and the response just drops right off. And so that's why in that case, you wanna, well, you could use half the dipole, but you wanna use the two halves connected together and work them against ground as a T antenna. And so, you, you know, it's just a matter of clip leads and try things, but I think for, for anything that isn't, that isn't really, really long, you need to operate it against ground. Yeah, yeah. I, I also have a just a plain long wire that's about 180 feet. Uh, we have a lot of land here, a little over 12 acres. Yeah. And uh, God, I hate that video when it catches you at the wrong moment. Um, it, it's, uh, it, and I use the, the long wire primarily, but I, I was experimenting with it getting, yeah, I was getting pretty good results. But the only thing I did not do is utilize the entire antenna structure for the antenna itself. And that's what you're telling me. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, give it a shot and see what happens. <laughs> hey, Al. Yeah. Here's a bag of these. Do you need 
a little variable capacitors from transistor radios. Let me see. There we go. Oh, what what do you got? I got a couple of bags of uh, I think these are three sixty five puff. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Radio. Okay. So if you need a bunch, they're yours. Okay. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Bring them around, and then we'll spread them out to people and encourage them to build build radios. <laughs> All right. Sounds good to me. Yeah, the, the problem with those the problem with those th those things is you got to figure out how to put a knob on them because it's metric hardware, but there's ways around it. <laughs> yeah, I had a and I did have knobs at one time, but they, they kind of uh, disappeared. Mm. <laughs> so. Anyway. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks, Al. Okay, well, you're most welcome. I'll leave you guys uh, do your business meeting if you need to. Here, I'll hang around for a while. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. It was Thank really you. Thanks, Al. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Thanks having job, you. Um, nice having everybody from the NJARC here. Very nice, Al. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Al. All right. Thanks, Al. Yeah. So, so everybody else who's hanging around, I guess uh, I'm going to be closing up the meeting shortly. Um, is there any other uh, announcements or anything else anybody wants to talk about besides the upcoming show on Sunday, which I'm sure everybody has well, well memorized and they're ready to go? Um, any, uh, Larry, is there any announcements you need to make before we shut down? Well, um, just, the, just the show, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there. Um, one thing that's a little concerning is uh, the uh, COVID cases in, for New Hampshire and Maine for that matter are about as high as they've ever been. They're breaking records. So, uh, you know, we have the vaccine and uh, I think most of us have been vaccinated, but um, it's a little concerning. So as always, uh, you know, use your ju best judgment, uh, best practices, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously come at your own risk. I'm going to be there. I'm not going to let it keep me away, but. Uh, no, that sounds, that's, that's about as all the advice you can really offer because, uh, you know, I think we're going to be struggling even probably into next year of having these ebbs and flows here. But, um, you know, it'll never go to zero or it'll take a long time for it to go to zero. So, you know, I think, we, um, I think like you said, everyone just used their own best judgment here and uh, you feel comfortable wearing a mask. Nobody will be, uh, it'll be insulted if you wear a mask. We, we certainly are used to seeing everybody in masks from the past shows in Brookline. So, uh, you know, it won't be a big deal. I plan to be there, camera in hand. Marriott's policy is masks are recommended, but they're they're not going to kick you out if you don't have one. Oh, I see. Okay, well, it's good to know um, that there is somewhat of a policy uh, there, at least for people's uh, FYI. Um, but yeah, no, looking forward to the show. And I know, will you have the working teletype, uh, Larry? I will, I will. I have made a list, so I make sure I have everything with me this time and I have a table dedicated to it. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's coming, I've been playing with it all week. I got my Model 14 transmitter, transmitter distributor for uh, which reads the tapes and uh, sends the data from uh, pre-punched tapes to the teletype. Got that working just this morning. So that'll be part of the. Oh, hey, Larry. You just went to mute there, Larry. Larry? I know. I, just, I stopped talking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, know. I, just, I thought I saw I the mouth moving. <laughs> I uh, I've I've had I I'm watching where it says temporarily unmuted up on my screen and uh, anytime I've been talking I've had my uh, finger on the space bar and that's been up there. Very good, very good. Uh, I'm just uh, kind of new to uh, to uh, to Zoom myself, 
Uh, I have, uh, if you would like it, I have the innards to a uh, uh, bottle 33 teletype. Uh, I have both the keyboard and I have the uh, some of the other mechanics go along with it. And I also have a teletype distributor. And if you're interested in them, you're welcome to them. They're both in good condition. Well, I appreciate it, Mark, but uh, I'm downsizing for a move coming up next year. And in the past couple of years, I've given away a Model 32, two Model 33s all working and a transmitter distributor. So I'm, I'm downsizing. Yep, you muted once again there, Larry. Well, I'm mu muted, but I'm not talking. I wasn't talking while I was muted, according to my computer here. That's funny because I can see your, I can see your mouth moving, yet it, where the sense doesn't finish. But the mute, the mute symbol is on. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just unmute myself permanently then. Can you hear me now? I can hear you great. Okay, well, yep. apparent, apparently the space bar trick isn't all it's uh, cracked up right. to be. He was just fooling us, John. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I know. You see the mouth movie? It was just a joke we saw play as kids. You know, someone's wearing the ear set and you, and you make, <laughs> move your mouth and say, what? What's up, darling? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. But yeah, no, I so I guess that's probably our big, um, our our big short term event. And of course, we'll have the next show in uh, on what's it, March sixth, if memory serves. Um, but uh, our Zoom meeting to our next Zoom meeting will probably be focused on covering uh, uh, highlights of the uh, the uh, electronics vintage electronics expo number four. This will be uh, on uh, this coming Sunday. So I'll be sure to uh, share photos and anyone else that. Station, it's all in my webpage. Hey guys, I got completely bumped off. That's it. Thanks. John, move your lips so we know you're there. Yeah, sorry. I was happily talking and then I got completely the Zoom window closed <laughs> automatically. And that was it. And it took about a solid minute for to to, uh, to uh, reconnect. <laughs> now, the thing I'm hoping for is that I hope I didn't lose the recording from Al because um, I was recording at the time I got bumped off, so I don't know how, and it claims I restarted recording, so I don't know whether it will pick up or I hope it doesn't overwrite my recording, because otherwise it all- there wasn't, there wasn't much, John. No, I'm just hoping that, you know, Zoom, I don't know how, how uh, elegant Zoom handles this, whether I still have the recording from before I got bumped off. I, have, I had that happen to me before and I lost a good part of the recording. But fingers crossed. Well, you're right, back. Larry. Okay. Well, here it is. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it. It's kind of dark in this room. But oh, there's the that. Looks nice. A crystal detector down here. Uh, this is, uh, this tunes the uh, series tuned antenna circuit. And this is the parallel tuned detector circuit here. It's even got a little vernier knob in the middle. Uh, you know, one of these old caps with the vernier uh, knob concentric with the other one. And um, this is the back of it here. It uses a couple air ducts. It's probably uh, way over coupled. Uh, and uh, the, the coil is tapped for a with a tap switch here. And uh, one thing I should do is move the, uh, probably put a clip off the detector so that right now the detector uh, moves with the tap switch, uh, which also changes the amount of coil you're using. Um, but that's obviously like Al explained, loading down the the tuned circuit too much. So probably should put a clip on the coil for the detector to move around. 
because there's not room for another switch on the panel. But I, I've heard I've heard on 160 meters a couple AM hams on this on 160 meters in New England. Slap hammer. Anyway, that's my shortwave crystal set. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Well, I guess we're getting close to that witching hour. I guess um, if there is nothing else, anybody, any other show and tells or announcements or any other side stories before I uh, hang up? One more, one more uh, reminder here is uh, we, for those of you who are hams, we have our net tomorrow morning on 3805 at 930 a.m. So um, if you if you'd like to join us, you got a ham license, and uh, you know that's where we'll be. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, I want to thank Al one more time for a great presentation. I'll share the link with everybody um, for for the reading. And uh, in fact, uh, and. Uh, in fact, if I may say, you know, a very big thumbs up there from me. Um, I really, and also I uh, thank the uh, NGRC members who joined us. That was great. Nice having a uh, some cross cross club meetings, and we should do this again um, because I think that uh, we get, you know, I think we all we're all the better when we get to uh, meet each other and also expand our knowledge. But uh, so thanks very much for, for with everybody to to join, and wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving uh, uh, going forward, and of course the holidays, and, and of course hopefully I'll see a number of people at the show on Sunday. So thanks very much. You guys all have a great evening, and we'll uh, be in touch. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thanks for running great. it, John. Or, uh, John and See My pleasure. Show on Sunday. I you. did the easy part. Al did the Bye -bye. hard part. <laughs> Thanks again, Al, if you're still here. Hey, yeah, don't, be, don't be afraid to email me if you have questions. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you, John. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Yes, you will. Mark hey, I'll send me the PDF when you get time. Uh, yeah, I'll put a link up on, on the communicator for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Great. I'll send it up to you, John. Super. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.